Based on the ability to resolve cases to date, with an increase in the quality of data secured, the unidentified and purported anomalous nature of most UAP will likely resolve to ordinary phenomena and significantly reduce the amount of UAP case submissions. To me, this is the most concerning part of this report. Now, any viewers of this channel, you'll know that I talk a lot about the secrecy uh, surrounding UAP and why it's there uh, uh, and the lack of official explanation of, of why it's there. But on top of that, the parallels between the 1950s, 1960s, primarily through the late 1960s, of how the government and military at that time had set up the investigations that they did. Uh, ultimately, we, we refer to it as, as Project Blue Book, but there were a few programs in there. And how they dealt with it, why they did it, and ultimately them closing everything. Uh, and then we didn't hear about UFOs literally for decades and decades. I talk a lot about the parallels because it has concerned me now for a couple of years that that is exactly what is playing out now. Now, for those who don't know me, I know and believe based on evidence, both through FOIA and outside of FOIA, that there's something to these phenomena. I say it plural. I think that there's multiple facets to this. I think there may be multiple, well, there's obviously multiple explanations, some of which are just very earth-based. Um, and I'm not here to argue the, the alien hypothesis to you, uh, but rather that there is a section here that we humans, I think, just don't quite understand yet. Um, and, and that, I believe, is, is evident uh, throughout history. But when you get to the investigations, like, again, Project Blue Book, you see how that played out. You juxtapose that with how this is playing out. All of a sudden, you start to see things really unfolding in the exact same way. And this, again, has been a concern of mine for quite some time. Now, put it visually for you. It all started with a threat. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously talking about Project Blue Book, but also juxtapose that again with today, that it all started with a threat, that there was a problem the military had to investigate because there was a, a, a public interest on top of that threat. The concern in the post-World War II environment, um, you know, through 1946, 47, 48, that time frame, when you got into Project Sign, then Grudge, and then Project Blue Book, ultimately, that public interest coupled with the threat paved the way for de a, dec a couple decades long UFO investigation. But the evidence, once it came out more and more, you can realize that it was much less a investigation but rather much more an explanation. Now, that is a whole video presentation in itself. I've talked a little bit about it in, in past videos. I won't regurgitate it all here. But Project Blue Book was a farce. But it had to deal with those two things, the threat and the public interest that was not going away. The UFO phenomena was given more credibility at that time by military personnel and prominent politicians as it progressed, which prolonged funding and interest. You look at those former and, and current at the time, military personnel that were saying things, sometimes in books, sometimes in press conferences, and you fast forward through the mid 60s, then you had people like Gerald Ford, prior to him becoming president, pushing the UAP issue as a huge concern and something that needed to be dealt with. A lot of this sounds familiar. You start exchanging some of these names with people today, and they fit almost identically to how this has played out in the past. Now, all of that interest, the threat, and all of that dialogue in the public sphere led to the military, obviously starting Grudge Sign, later Blue Book, and doing the investigation for decades, looking at the cases, digesting everything, and then coming to a quote-unquote conclusion. They concluded that the majority of the cases were explainable. Now, even by their own admission, it was not everything. There's a famous number, 701, that remained unidentified after Project Blue Book closed. However, the problem with that is once you start looking at a lot of the cases, you realize that 701 number was likely much, much larger. On top of that, the... the uh, 
a section on the black vault that I call from the desks of Bro project blue book added other case files that were found from a former project blue book, uh, personnel member in a garage somewhere, you realize that there were cases that weren't in the massive, uh, data set that is now at the national archives. A lot of stuff didn't survive. It, it got either destroyed, shredded, or copies were taken home by other people. But the fact remains that that 701 number likely isn't accurate at all. Another quick point on that, when I posted Project Blue Book documents, gosh, probably close to a decade ago, and created this massive search engine, kind of turned into an ugly story of uh, copyright claims by Ancestry.com. Uh, I'll bore you with that story another day. Uh, but the bottom line was it got major press and publicity. And as a result, people from the 1960s and even 50s were writing me directly because they found their sighting in the Blue Book files that even though it was readily available if they cared to go to the National Archives, the resource that I had created allowed people to search for it and find it like that. And so they did. And I started compiling responses from people um, that uh, stretched into the double digits. I'm not talking about hundreds, uh, but rather probably 15, 20 people that had found their case file, saw what the government and military labeled it as, and they said, there is no way that this was the explanation for my case and that they changed part of the facts behind it. And I started piling these up, realizing, wow, Blue Book was much more of a farce than I than I ever realized. So sorry to go off on that tangent, but all of the statistics and stuff that we've learned about Blue Book, in my opinion, is provably false, that the, the percentage of unexplained is likely much, much larger. And I think that that's an important point to punch um, with that particular era. So even though they claimed that most were explainable, they convened a panel back in the 1960s of scientists to independently look at the findings. And you, you kind of look at the NASA uh, effort and stuff like that. You start to juxtapose all of this. It, it seems very, very familiar. But that being said, that panel of scientists came together, looked at decades worth of cases, and they determined that the UFO phenomena, whatever it may be, was not a threat to national security, didn't warrant further investigation, and recommended that the investigation be closed. And that's exactly what the U.S. Air Force did. They halted the investigation. They stopped it. And for well over 40 years, the government stopped talking about UFOs. It bought them decades. Now, documentation proves that's not entirely true. They wanted you to believe they didn't care. But in reality, the CIA, the NSA, the DIA, and quite a few other places were still collecting and looking at UFO reports from around the globe. So that also was a lie by the U.S. government. Uh, however, they used kind of that, that effort to justify them saying, ah, we just don't care about UFOs. We looked at it. We gave it a shot. And everything is primarily explainable. The cases, and I'm paraphrasing their point on this, but the cases that did not have an explanation, they felt if they had better data, better instrumentation, or uh, essentially more data in front of them about those respective cases, they too would be identified. That's exactly what I just read to you from this new report that essentially they're saying, if we have better data, that we'd likely be able to solve the majority of these. Well, the reality is they probably could, but it's the small percentage of stuff that truly is anomalous. Don't take my word, I'm not guessing. That's Dr. Kirkpatrick's word that he said in the congressional hearing that he took part in, that there was a small percentage of truly anomalous cases that they could not identify that they were collecting. And I did the math at the time with his percentage that he gave. It was roughly about 30 to 40 cases uh, or so, um, obviously a rough estimate, but that's a lot of cases that they've collected that would be truly anomalous. Now, what's his definition of truly anomalous? It's hard to tell. Uh, we, we don't really know that. But for him to go on the record and say that, that to me is a big deal. But those types of statements are lost in these reports. These types of reports say, ah, oh, better data, everything explainable. <laughs> well, 
That's probably not true, given the documented history that we can already call back on. And it's playing out the exact same way.